Welcome to Make That Paper, the show where we talk about all the crazy jobs we do to make the cash we need to pursue our artistic dreams. And to flip off the pandemic and get out and enjoy some national parks. Today, we are talking about the French translation occupation or that substitute education vocation. And then there's the old medical experimentation situation. We are your hosts, Jamie Parker Stucco. And Jason Bieber. And on this episode, we are talking to an inspirational actress, improviser, comedian, writer, teacher, and coach. You've seen her in all the best shows and movies like Veep, Curb Your Enthusiasm, Parks and Rec, Bridesmaids. Are you just going to keep listing her credits? Yeah, I might. Okay. She voices characters on Family Guy. She wrote a fabulous children's book. And she is a public speaking coach to some of the biggest names in the corporate world. And even after all that, she is so much more. We are so lucky to have her on the show. Please welcome the brilliant Megan Grano. Thank you so much. I love your intros so much. (laughs) They're so detailed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're so excited. I'm so excited because, um, Megan, like myself, is from Michigan, but I like to say Detroit when you're from the Detroit area or like within six miles of it, you're from Detroit. Um, That's my thing. I also just want to say really quick before I let it go, I've been mulling it over for a while this morning and I was like, how do your husband and his brother adopt Jason so I can be yours and Molly's sister-in-law? I just want to know how to get in in the sister-in-law crew. I think it'd be a pretty good canale. I think so too. You don't want that. No? (laughs) Okay. No. I'm not saying it'd be good for me. I'm saying I bring (laughs) bring something to the table. (laughs) <laughs> also, don't say that. Don't say. It. Don't say you told a lie. Okay, okay just just retract everything. Yeah. Okay, I'm just taking it all back. Okay. Mm-hmm. Even I'm even my sons, I'm like, do you guys really want this last name? No. <laughs> I have Grano. Grano to offer you. Yeah. Or Grano, if you're feeling East Coasterly. My I I don't have his last name. I have Jason's last name either. But Jack has both our last names, and so okay. when he's at school. Um, I was with him. I don't know if it's a doctor or school like three weeks ago. I can't remember, but he, they said, and what's your name? And he said, Jack Danger Bieber Stickle. And like, he made such like, a, he threw it down. Like, and I was like, it's actually Stickle Bieber, but yeah. you're right. It should be Bieber Stickle. It's <laughs> happening here. There's a little bit kind Very of better cute. flow to Bieber Stickle. <laughs> he did. He dug it. He was like, mm-hmm. I like that. Good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. I mean, he's yeah. he's good. I think we can emancipate him now. Yep, he's ready. He's done. He doesn't mm-hmm. need any more parenting. Not from us. <laughs> he tells us we're terrible at it anyway. So for a long time, for it's a long time. But you had a question. You wanted to go right into. I wanted to just dig right in. Okay. Let's talk yeah. about like all, all your it. jobs and stuff. Like, let's do it. You you had gone from UNC. You were in Chicago. And you got to Chicago. Now, what was the first like? What was the first thing you did for? Because when you got to Chicago and you went to Second City, you did school. You did classes at Second yes. City. Yes. And those are, those aren't free. And you know, um, what what were you doing for work when you got to Chicago? When I got to Chicago, I worked doing data entry at a law firm. Yeah. Killer. Killer no jobs. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Very depressing for me. Super glad to have an income to pay for said classes, yeah. mm-hmm. but truly monotonous, tedious, boring work. And I loved college and I loved performing. And it just felt like all day I was sitting in this dark office typing people's names and addresses into some legal software. Yeah. No, so, there's a better way. You did leave UNC to go to Chicago to be an actor. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and immediately started at Second City or? I immediately started at Second City and IO. And I No, wait a minute. No, I started at IO immediately, like yeah. two days after moving there. Nice. And then I started at Second City a couple months later. I auditioned to be in their conservatory. Mm-hmm. And I think there was a little delay on classes, but it was a couple months after I got there that I started the conservatory. I also only lasted at the data entry job for six months because it was so deadening to me. <laughs> six months is, uh, I, I did a three-day data entry job that was a, the longest I've ever been able to Ugh. do straight data entry. Well, I had interned at ABC News Detroit and it, much like the data entry job, 
I wasn't doing the cool stuff an intern does. I didn't, I didn't realize you and I both had that in common as well, that I interned at a news station and loathed it. And, journal- no, I never got- and journalism majors. Yeah. Yes. It's oh, the- maybe that explains. That you explains. don't, you don't know how mundane and terrible it is. Oh. And that's why they make up stories right. <laughs> because we're bored as F. Mm-hmm. It is so, <laughs> yes. It is so toxic. It is like, wow. The worst. Well, I remember this woman when I was an intern calling in and going, the Michael Jackson story, like he had a book come out, a biography or something, and or I don't know what it was, but she was like, I wrote that. They stole it from me. Uh-oh. And they were like, oh, she calls every year and says this. And But, <laughs> but they literally made me, she was like, I invented Motown. I had to, with little internet, I am because it's it's like oh. 2000 yes. it's like the year 2000 so internet isn't what it is today people yes. google was not the resource it is today no. and to like dissect this story and find out the truth it was actually pretty great but i spent a summer doing that but you know Ugh. it's like they already knew the answer like she was just like in a mental hospital like yeah, she was yeah. sick like it was yes. true it's a so- great segue to my second job in chicago after yeah. i did data entry I, I can't say the name of it because I already got fired from the job for doing this. I signed it. I don't know how long confidentiality lasts, Ooh. but I worked at a talk show. To the grave, <gasps> I think. To the grave. Yeah. To the grave. Shows. Yeah. I worked we know what shoots show. in Chicago. I can guess. Yes. Uh-huh. I talked about, in a show, I talked about working at said talk show. Somebody turned me in and then I got fired. So ah. it was brutal, but... There was a lot at the talk show, and I'm talking very vaguely here, so yeah, I think I'm okay, yeah. of people claiming big claims, and then me in my lowly job having to do research. And again, this was the year 2000. Yep. Uh-huh. I was right there with you. Yep. And I had no real internet to track it down, so I'd be doing phone calls, yeah. and uh, it was it was insane. You're calling their family members, and they're yes. like, mm-hmm. don't talk to me about this person. You're calling like... <laughs> The place they pick up their prescriptions, Long's Drugs. Um, you're calling like these Randa and you're just like, you're little and your voice is little. And you're like, hi. <laughs> and no one wants to tell you anything. They don't want to be involved. No. And you're like, well, I'm calling from ABC News Detroit. Yeah. Click. There's two kinds of people. When the news calls, there's the people who are excited and who just want to like talk. That, And that's probably the person who calls in and claims they invented Motown. Uh-huh. <laughs> Um, which I can verify is not true because I invented Motown. Um, oh, yes, that's right. You, yeah, I, it didn't work out for me either. <laughs> and then there's the, you know, the more sensible folks who know, like, don't talk to the news. <laughs> don't talk to the news lady yeah. who, who just wants your information so she can feed it to, you know. Well, let, don't talk to the talk show lady because she's <laughs> going to put you on blast because their filter is much different than the news. Mm. <laughs> Lower threshold for truth. Especially if it's the show that I'm thinking it is. Low threshold. God, I Low. need to know what show this Low. was. How, how long did you last? I I lasted there six months. That's how long I lasted. At, at, yeah, I was like... It was, it was sad that. because my best friend's dad got me the job, was a very high up at the organization. And I love their family. We're still friends. But I just didn't think that confidentiality thing was so rigorous. I thought it was like, I wasn't, and I honestly, the show I was in, I never said anything bad about the talk show host. I was talking about some of the silly uh, jobs that I did there, Yeah. Mm-hmm. but I guess, you know, that's just, it's not okay. Well, that's a fun, that's a, you know, I think we've all kind of had that where we're, we have these, these dual lives and we kind of bring one into the other. Yeah. Um, and we talk about our day job. I mean, shit, that's all we're doing is talking about our day jobs. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, sometimes it comes back and it bites you. I mean, I've definitely, <laughs> afraid of that. I remember doing stand up and had making some, you know, some jokes at the expense of my employers who decided to come to a show. Oh no. Yeah, come support. <laughs> oh, they were there to support you. It's interesting that you bring that up, Bieber, because they came to your show, but then they also asked you to come and do the company roast. That's for true. That, yes, yes, twice. After twice. you banned so them, they on loved stage. you. They, they they did love me. This yeah. was I was um, well, it was an accounting firm in the in the valley, and 
over the course of four years, I went from being a temp to being the managing director of the firm. Um, <laughs> WTF. <laughs> like that would ever happen to anyone but a man. And, and it's it's true. It's true. Jason no, no, I definitely Bieber. had, I definitely was riding the white male train all the way. And, and I rode it right off the rails. Oh, no. uh, oh yeah. And like I was there, I had it all and they were off for, and I was like, you know what? This isn't me. I got to go. Oh. <laughs> and I there, wish you could get that job back. Yeah, I tried. The train derailed. Later. Oh I, no. I can't I, believe you did that in four years. In four years, I went from, from intern or not intern, from temp, temp hey. to um, IT department to head of the IT department to running the firm for a good year and a half. And then I was like, I, this, you know, I've, I've got this improv thing going on. I, I think I really got to give that a chance. He quit for improv. Uh -huh. I know. Um, but, but Megan, when you got, but dumped, then I got the cruise ship, so it was all fine. Oh yeah. <laughs> Cause that money was so equipped. Yeah, it's, um, <laughs> It worked out. Yeah, yeah. Tip for tat. Um, <laughs> Life left, experience is valuable. It is. When you left the um, the talk show of your mm -hmm. own accord, because yes. let's be honest, talking about it on stage after signing confidentiality, there's a little part of us that is like, let's just really see what they're going to do. Like, yeah, how sure. are they going to mm -hmm. know? Sure. And what's the worst thing that can happen? Um, sure. What happens next? It, you know, by the way, backing up my sister-in-law, Molly Erdman, I was mm -hmm. a guest on her show. She had, she had her own little improv talk show and I was a guest on that. And she's and been a guest we, on this show. It, we had a fun time, like playing with the audience being like, I'm about to talk about something confidential. We did the lights <laughs> up and down. Like we made it a total, oh my total joke. Cause to me, that's what it was. Oh, and yeah, sure. Lo and behold. Wait, bye who bye. was there? Who was the spy that was there that saw? Him? Oh God, it was so crazy. It was a neighbor of a camera person, a camera operator. Come on! Oh my God, that's, what an that's, asshole! That's hearsay anyway. <laughs> let's call, let's name that person. What an yeah. asshole! Right? Mm -hmm. Oh my God! Yeah. Yep. You're so a young woman. Dana Lewinsky of, of uh, Chicago. Chicago, you're on blast. Um, Orland Park or some suburb like that. I don't know. know. I, I just have to say, like, you're a young woman working hard, bringing it on stage. And this, the audacity of some middle-aged woman we're who should be, well, yeah. We're, she yeah. knows. We're assuming. I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. She's she, her name. She was Karen. She Karen should have been supporting your ass and been like, good for her. Mm -hmm. Oh, honey, that's so fun. She's so yeah. good. I want her to make it. Not, oh, she talked. She mm -hmm. said something. Mm -hmm. Oh, please. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't get away with that stuff now anyways, because, you know, cell phone, I mean, people record every, like. I know, I know. know and then, and if, if it had been recorded, I feel like I would have had some, what's that word? People might have been on my side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, uh -huh. Again, I never, I would feel like confidentiality is about like, are you out there sharing like secrets of the, the celebrity or something like that? Right. right. But when I'm talking about my experience, my job, you know, looking at mail, doing research, yeah. like that's not anything to do with the host, but true, oh, yeah. done yeah. and done. Done and done. And I just want, I mean, we'll close it here, but I think it's, great that that happened because otherwise like many people we know they get jobs at for reality tv shows you would have yes. been stuck as a producer for reality totally. television mm -hmm. totally totally mm -hmm. you would have been in that world. i would have been in that world a long time mm -hmm. i'm sure yeah yeah that's that happens you know yes did you like the job no no so there you go <laughs> yeah yeah not a bit so then, I, can I say that? I don't know. Are they going to come after I, me What does your NDA say? <laughs> can we go I back and check it? Uh, I had to. I can't even find my lease for this apart for this house, let alone the, I know. The NDA signed 15, no 20 way. years ago. Yeah. No way. Yeah. The other thing is, there was a book that came out the exact time this happened of a big employee who worked there who revealed all the secrets. Yeah. Oh. So. This was just using me as an example of like, no matter who you are, you're going to get tossed from this yeah. company. So mm -hmm. whatever, yeah. it all, it all. But I left there and ended up at a, I found this great job as a, um, well, before I got there, actually, I did medical experiments. 
And yeah. oh my God. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. You know what I bet our listeners are thinking right now? What's that, Beaver? They're probably thinking, this podcast thing is so easy. I could start my own podcast. And you know what? They're right. Yeah, we've been using Anchor for a few months now, and it has totally changed our game. Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free! I said, let me explain. Fine. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. And Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and pretty much anywhere podcasts are streamed. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. I mean, it's everything you need to make a podcast, all in one place. And it's free! Yes. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. And we're back. Okay. Oh, so medical experiments. <laughs> or, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely need some clarification. Were you the like, subject? Were you doing I like- was the subject. So you could sign up at University of Chicago. It, it was this sort of stopgap before I found my next paying job, regular paycheck yeah. in Chicago to support my improv habit. But huh. I had a few months of signing up at University of Chicago to be, that's the biggest water bottle I've ever seen. <laughs> Stole it from me. That is actually a sparklet tank. It is. It is. It's It's a one gallon. With a handle. Well, the sparklets don't have the handle. Just needs a handle. Are you spilling? No, I'm splashing. (laughs) That is incredible. (laughs) I love it. But we digress. I'm sorry. I interrupted myself. I I went to University of Chicago, reputable university, Mm -hmm. and they had all sorts of experiments that you could sign up to be a part of for pay. Yeah. I did one where I got, they called it temporary amnesia. So that's Mm. terrifying. That's crazy. They give you a shot. And then I actually don't know what they do to you during that time. (laughs) No. And they do some stuff. They're just testing how long, I guess they, I actually, they never really tell you what they're testing. They don't tell you. Well, I can understand how that how would much undermine they pay the... you for that. And where did you find this? You, well, once you get in the system, I don't remember how I found the first one, but once I was a willing participant in these research studies and experiments, they would be like, Hey, do you want to do this other one? And I'm like, yeah, great. Mm-hmm. Like 500 bucks, whatever. Oh, I did that one. And that was just a one day one. And it was probably a couple hundred bucks, but then I did one that ended my medical experiment thing. And I'll just Uh-oh. tell you that story. Cause it's pretty good. Uh-oh. I did find out what it was about because I was released from the study. <laughs> They were like, okay, every Monday for six weeks, you're going to come here. We're going to inject you intravenously with something. We can't tell you what it is. And then we're going to run tests on you. And then at the end of the six weeks, you'll, you, you get some pay up front. At the end of the six weeks, you get the rest of the money. I was like, okay, I'll do this. You were responsible for getting yourself to University of Chicago, but then they sent you home in a limo. And I was oh like, this God. is great. Like oh I have God. a driver, all this stuff. An and actual like stretch limo? Yeah. Wow. Okay. It was nice. I was like, this is cool. And that was a far drive for me because I was up on the north side of the city. So it was it was like a nice luxury hour for a 22-year-old girl who has no money. I was like, this is great. And I did the first week, it was fine. Get the drugs, nothing, nothing at all. Just like, oh, okay, just totally myself. And then they had me draw stuff. They put my arm in ice. They had me do a whole slew of things. And I was like, yeah, all fine. And then they drove me home. It was great. Then the next Monday I went back and they put the needle in my arm and then I felt something go in and I was like, oh, and I immediately felt crazed and, and really relaxed. And I, they submerged my arm in the bucket of ice. I could barely feel it. They had me draw stuff and I was just loopy. And when it came time to go home for my ride in the limo, I basically don't remember it. I got home and then the next morning I was actually supposed to substitute teach and I heard the phone ringing and ringing and I was like, I can't get to the phone. It felt like it was down a far hallway and I lived in a studio where the phone was right next to my bed. Oh, <laughs> so I was like, oh, that was crazy. And I, and I missed subbing that day and I was fine the next day. But when I went back the following Monday, I went in and I said, hey, I just want to double check. Could I not get that drug that you did last week? I don't know if I can ask for that. 
but it really knocked me out for the next day too. <laughs> oh no. So the the nurse leaves and then I waited 2 hours so I knew something was wrong and the nurse came back with the doctor who was conducting the experiment who I wasn't supposed to meet. And they're like, we're going to release you from this study. We're going to actually give you full pay. We want to let you know that what we were doing was testing morphine. And we accidentally, the nurse who administered it last week gave you, I was supposed to get point whatever, like 0.1 of the dose, but they actually gave me one point blank <gasps> of the dose. So it was like, way, Oh my way God. <laughs> I have so... They I could have, have killed you. It was I so have, much morphine. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's, let's, I'm so upset right now. Let's I'm just, so mad. We got to deconstruct this for, okay. for, uh, from a few different angles. First of all, um, morphine's been around for a really long time. I yeah. don't think in, what year was this? Like 2000, 2000. 2001, maybe? Yeah, they're not, yeah. That, 2001, they're not like figuring out, oh, well, what does morphine do? No. So I mean, they were they were testing. The doctor told me exactly how much pain it takes to wake you out of a morphine induced state. So the point of the bucket of ice uh, that I don't remember from my more. So the other stuff was distraction, so that I wouldn't know what they were doing, drawing and things like that. Uh, the okay. ice thing was the real test because it was so painful. The first week they would hold my arm in there uh -huh. and for varying lengths of time. Cause I was there for five hours and I'd be like, please get my arm out. It kills. Like if you've ever yeah. had your arm in a bucket of ice for any length of time, it's yeah. so painful. The week that I got the morphine OD, I didn't even feel it. Like it's sitting in there for two minutes, which is a really long time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah. And they're like, and how does it feel? <laughs> <laughs> so it was, that was the point of the research. I wonder if this is when there was like, developing um now all the all the the narcotics that are killing everybody the opioids, opioids. Oh. i was just gonna say like you were part of like this is exactly what's been running through my head like oh my god this is huge you could write an entire book about just this the, yeah the, like the opioid crisis may have started with you <laughs> My mind is blown right now. Really? Sorry about Prince. Did you? Okay. <laughs> Let me ask you about your parents really quick. Did they know that you were doing medical experiments? Yeah. And they were like, okay, just be careful. I don't, I think they probably wondered what I was doing with my life in right. general. Yeah. yeah. Mine just too. They probably figured you were life. taking the same stuff after hours anyway. <laughs> no, I'm sure. <laughs> that actually, I, I mean, that was one of my questions is like, and I, you know, feel free to not answer this, but w would you, were, were recreational drugs a part of your life at that time? Like, or was it strictly no, for medical? Reasons? I never, I never got into drugs. Good. I drank and that was it. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I never, way which better. by the way, when you mix it with morphine. <laughs> How would you know you? Because you wouldn't have been able to remember. <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm blown away. Yeah. I feel like I have to get on to subbing, but I'm I'm. Are we all sitting in this shock right now? Like I mean, like they're so lucky you did not sue. I can't feel my arm That's, right now. Yeah. It, I, I it was. They are lucky, and especially if they had known I came from such a legal family with my mom being a judge, my dad being oh a lawyer, God, like, yeah. but it never even occurred to me to sue. That's how foolish I was. Well, also because you were okay, so you're probably just thankful, yeah. like, yeah. I'm okay, and look, yeah. I only had to do it once, and I got my all my whole yeah. pay. Yeah, free drugs, exactly. free limo. <laughs> I'm good to go. Oh, I mean, geez. this is what they're doing, is they're like loading kids up with morphine and giving them limo rides. That's what's happening at well, the University I, I of just, Chicago. Our friend had, um, uh, our friend who had a baby at the same time as us, um, she went into labor a week after. Anyways, she had a doula, not a doula, a um, midwife, midwife, a midwife okay. at the hospital, and they were giving her morphine for the contractions, which is something they do overseas. Uh -huh. Oh, wow. and, and in 1913. And in 19. Yeah, that's what I saw. Yeah. They, they, they put it on the, they give it through like a gas, right? I don't think you can do well, morphine then what, as a then gas. What, it wasn't it's intravenous. What? Okay. So it was in a drip. Yeah. She's like, I don't even remember giving birth. And I was like, she was, I remember <laughs> her telling me to go on all fours. And, and she's like, I must just have a high tolerance. And I was like, no, they 
never giving you morphine. You just told me. Okay. So you missed a substitute teaching call. And I know I substitute taught for a day in Michigan and was like, yeah, no. Um, after you go through all that, like, you know, fingerprinting Ugh. and I don't, I don't even think I needed a test. I think I just needed to show that I had 90 credits. Like I graduated. Yep. Um, but here you have to take like the C best and everything in California, if you want to oh. substitute teach, but it wasn't that way in the Midwest. Um, yeah. Same in Chicago. I didn't have to do much anything. I don't know what it is here. I haven't checked, but I know some people doing it currently at the mo yeah. moment, because apparently they're short on teachers probably due to COVID yeah. and everything. So people are making, I heard in Burbank anyway, that it's double what they would used to pay. Wow. That's awesome. Okay. You have to take the CBEST exam, okay. which is math and English um, okay. and fractions. But <laughs> don't have to talk. So Just your friends all. who are doing it, they ace that. Um, I think it's open book, but I don't oh, know. But still, nice. do they give you the book? What is, where's the open book? Is it on Google? It's multiple I'm times. not sure because I'm afraid of substitute teaching. <sighs> Me Were too. you afraid of getting that call in the morning that you would like, this is like extra work to me. Like, you yeah, know, you get a call early in the morning, just like yeah. extras do for set. And they're like, oh, yeah. you have to be in Culver City, 45 yeah. minute drive in an hour. Exactly. Don't know I, I thought into. it was going to be my jam because I was like, I'm a performer. Wait till these children see me dazzle them. <laughs> <laughs> and I quickly learned I was the butt of every joke. Nobody was going to listen to me. They, it was just like parenting, like you were talking about with your son, that yeah. they immediately knew I had never taught before. And they were like, you're bad. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm, I'm a performer. Yeah. <laughs> and it just I could never get control of the class ever I I don't know what I did wrong and I was like wow I am so bad at this and I just left that I left and that you still how long kids. did you do it and you wrote a children's I'm, book so you I weren't know. that bad which by the way quick side note we got the book and Jack, we read it to Jack last night he loved it oh yeah. Yeah, everybody. I I we're gonna strongly, link to it. We're gonna link to the book. Yes, Thank AJ you. and the and the and the stir fry showdown. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, thanks. I it, that's super fun. But I was not. Maybe I would be a better sub today now that I have been a parent because I understand I need to yeah. be stern. And I was really preoccupied at the time with entertaining, which was not mm -hmm. not the best when it came to teaching. Mm -hmm. So I did five days of subbing, and then oh. that ended. Oh, okay. So this was a, it was a very brief stint. So when you missed the call because of the other thing, like you basically had just started. Exactly. She's uh, after my own heart. I would start something and then be like, yeah, this, I'm not feeling good about this. I feel sick to my stomach when you call. So I can't. 100%. Do this job. So I, I was going to ask you if, if you had any experiences that were positive, but I'd say after five days of leaving, probably none, right? <laughs> Nothing, nothing. nothing. No I had I had a bunch of brief stints before I landed in the job that sustained me the rest of my time in Chicago. But it's worth telling you this one other one because there is a good story with it. I yeah. got hired. I, so I, I left those two things. Medical was out. Subbing was out. I became a temp. And I got sent very early in my temp career to this lawyer. The temp agency said he is not able to retain a temp. He is a huge asshole for another <laughs> lack of another word. So I get in there and I'm like, I come from a family of lawyers. I'll be able to handle this guy. And sure enough, we, I was fine with him. He was meticulous. Some might say OCD. Yeah. And I'll give you an example. He had he would have me do things like fill out FedEx forms so that he could send paperwork to different clients. And if the form itself had like a fold in the corner of the edge of the paper, it, I wasn't allowed to use it. If, if it was erotic. a little bit off white, if it didn't look oh, perfectly wow. white, if, if when typing on the form, cause you would never use handwriting, if it wasn't aligned with each line and it maybe some of the font crossed over the line, he would make you do it again. Huh. He was meticulous. So that's why nobody ever lasted for him. But I was like, I, I can meet your OCD and one up you pal. I am like super, <laughs> no problem. And the third day I was there and the temp agency was like, nobody's ever lasted three days. This is amazing. And I was like, hey, no problem. Yeah. The third day he gave me this dictaphone thing to use. And he's like, can you take the dictaphone and just transcribe what I'm saying? He had dictated all this stuff. And I was like, sure. And I... <laughs> It was about an hour long recording. And it was the whole time I couldn't tell if he was saying his or its, like its property, his property, 
his or it's he it was mumbly yeah and at the end i was like oh it's 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 so i did find and replace and did replace all in the whole document replace all his with it's did that all uh-huh. printed it left it on his desk and go to lunch and i came back and was fired <laughs> and i was like what <laughs> and lo and behold the word the, history pardon me the word history Every time it said this in the document, it now mm. said tits. 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 There it is. T H I S became tits. Mm-hmm. So he just thought that I was I was messing with him, that I had just put <laughs> tits all over the document. And he's like, You're gone. You know? Gone. Oh was, my wow. God. Even <laughs> even after the FedEx labels. Ah. Oh. I don't know. It's funny. And I know you come from a law family, but Jason had clients. We have, he has a lot of clients with this company now that are lawyers and they're awesome. They're so great. So I'm not like dissing lawyers at all, but you have one firm that you were two firms that you were like, I have got to get rid of this client, even though they're my biggest paying client right yeah. now, it is not worth it. Some, but, some law firms and lawyers are insane. Insane. Yeah. <clears throat> do they do that sort of stuff to you where it's like this has nothing to do with the work you're just being fussy about something you yeah, did have one that I was like definitely that. have had that and you know it's they just they hold themselves to such a high standard and you know i'm i'm an it third you know third party it support company i'm not part of your organization but when i'm doing work for you for them they feel like i need to adhere to their <laughs> standards and rules and practices I'm like I, you know i don't i don't i'm only working for you and I, I don't work for you yeah <laughs> yes. i didn't go to yes. that training seminar yeah. um, and i'm not making what you you know anyway yes. Yes. But it, yeah. it makes all the people in the office that you have to work with sort of i don't want to use this word but i'm going to use it litigious in their own right because they're like he did it not me yeah. and it's like oh no no i'm just i no, no. what and, but like, they're so afraid of the lawyers yes. that they work for. That yeah, speaks they're... to, that speaks to culture, you know, that, that speaks to speak office to culture. culture yeah. And, yeah. 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 I just and noticed around... that in those law firms that you've worked for. Oof. Yeah. It's their, they, they do, they're litigating all day. So everything around them is contentious and that's yeah. the only way they know how to be. Yes. And I think, you know, as, as you've experienced as a temp, when it comes to culture, you got to be pretty nimble and versatile yes. and they, you know, the yeah. temp agency gives you what they can. It sounds like they, they prepped you a little bit for this guy, but <laughs> yeah. you know, you, you get there and it's your first day of work and they expect you to jump yeah. right in with both yeah. feet and know what you're doing. Yeah. And um, yeah, not that any, I, yeah. you know. Well, I, I attempt to, I couldn't get a job that clicked or lasted or made enough money and I was like done with Starbucks and done with Macy's and like, I just couldn't get to auditions and I couldn't make enough for my rent. And I was tired of doing two, three jobs. So I started temping. And the first thing they sent me to was, it wasn't a casting office, but it was like, they were producers, but they were the money people or something. So they had a role in everything. Like if they wanted somebody, they would like see this person we want to be in the show that we know, like, or whatever. Yeah. Right. But it, they had me as a receptionist and it was, I kid you not, the board was the size of a dining room table with lights and phones and everything going on at the same time. And I forgot what that's called, a switchboard. Switch and I was like, I don't know how, like I, I was so overwhelmed and I'll never forget how overwhelmed I was. And I would have to press a button, answer, and then look on this list. And they said, but you have to do it quickly, 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 yeah. quickly, quickly. And they kept snapping at me. And I was like, but there's 50 people on this list. And I have to find the extension. And it was like a, it was a four code extension plus a two button thing at the Ugh. switchboard. And I was like, so stressful. It was so stressful. You, you know, I mean, you, it's, you worked as a receptionist so for six years. I did, but it wasn't that kind of switchboard. It was, it was very easy. Okay. You yeah. all right? Basic small office. It was a small office. My boss was in the improv world oh, and awesome. just super cool. So she, I owe everything to her because most people, when I did eventually get hired at Second City in Chicago to do touring company, most people I knew, I think the touring company average salary for if you had a hot year of doing a ton of shows, you might have made fourteen thousand yes. dollars. 
no insurance, nothing, not sustainable living. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I toured for three years. My boss there made it work so that I could keep my job and health insurance while touring. That's she was awesome. like, I didn't have that kind of vacation days. I didn't have the kind of sick days to be gone that much for three years in a row. But she said, I really like you. You're actually on when you are in town. I was always on time. I did my job well. And she's mm -hmm. like, I don't want to lose you. I'd rather just deal with the days you're not here. So yeah. she, I was never paid for those days, which is fine. Sure. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. she just made it work. That's fantastic. Amazing. That's the, that's like the actor's dream job is not, like it, or actor's dream side job, yeah. day job. It's the, yeah. the job that, you know, knows what you like. You don't have to pretend no. you don't have to, it's not a secret that you're going out and doing other stuff or auditions yeah. or whatever. Were you auditioning as well? I was in Chicago. I think the only thing I ever really auditioned for, for my career was commercials. Sure. There was a yeah. stretch where I, I often reference this, like when I'm coaching people now that there was a stretch where I, I had an agent early on who was like, you seem to get really nervous when you audition for things. And I was like, yes, I do. <laughs> and this agent was like, I think what we'll do is an exercise for you over the next 30 or six, I think it was 60 days was just, I'm going to send you on as many auditions as, as I can. You're not going to be right for most of them. Mm -hmm. And I, I wasn't, I wasn't right for hardly anything, but he was right that that taught me over the course of all those days of constantly showing up, having to prepare, just show up, get ready. It did get rid of the nerves. What a fantastic agent. I don't know was, any agent in LA that would do such a thing. No, I mean, what the I, hell? I, was, I was going for student film. It was all like student stuff at Northwestern or. Well, I, don't, uh, did, I don't know an agent who would bother submitting on a student film anyway. So right. still amazing. It was great. It was so, so great to help me learn how to manage nerves when you're auditioning. Yeah. 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 So but I did, that was before, no, yeah, I think that was before, that must have been in my, during my uh, data processing or data entry days. Yeah. But I think it was, I know it was during Chicago, so let's leave mm -hmm. it at that. <laughs> <laughs> but for the receptionist job, you like you did have some you were you were going on commercial auditions yes. in addition to going out of town for yes. touring jobs. Yes. And like, I don't know. I know that when I had day jobs where I worked for other people, I was pretty secretive about, oh, yeah. I've got an audition. So I've got to take this lunch that's really yes. also a dentist appointment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I did for that some for reason, I'm going to come back to work wearing different clothes. Yeah. <laughs> I did that for a while too. And then I realized my boss was in Chicago and I was in LA. And so he really wasn't watching. And uh, as long yeah. as nobody complained, it was like, cool. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. It was totally, yeah. That's a, one of those other dream situations, I think. Oh, yeah. where, and I think a lot of the working world is that way now, mainly Especially due to COVID. Remote work. That it's yeah. like, hey, you got your work done. Who cares? Yeah. yeah. Unsupervised, pro, you know, high level productivity is the way yeah. of the future. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think <laughs> actors did that for America. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I think actors did that for America. Um, we have done that and we've solved the opioid beginnings. We've done I mean, so much today to change America. You're welcome. I, I, I'm like, I, the first time I saw you perform was at IO here in LA and oh, you okay. did your one woman show and it was, oh. it blew my mind. And then every time you had a guest appearance on a show, I was like, Oh, Megan Grano, of course she's working. Oh, oh Megan Grano, of course she's working. Thank you. So, which brings me to what took you from Chicago to LA? Like what made you make that leap? Because you were doing okay. You were, you know, you had a good agent, you're touring, which always comes to well, you, at some point. You were on, you were on main state ETC. I did both. I, Mary <clears throat> Beth Monroe moved here mm -hmm. to Los Angeles. And then I took her spot on the main stage. So I filled in for her for six months, which was a great experience. I thought I was going to get her job permanently, but I didn't get it when she, when they actually created the new show. Mm -hmm. And then it was about eight months later that I got the ETC stage instead and did that show. And I was pretty mad at second city at that time. Cause I had done a good job at main stage. I was annoyed that they didn't give me the job yeah. mm -hmm. and replaced me with a man. So then it, I was like, come on guys. I thought we were three and three 
you made it back to four men, two women. I, I was fairly frustrated with Second City. And that plays into why I only did one show in mm-hmm. on the ETC. I loved it so much. And I still do regret it leaving, but I wasn't enamored with Second City anymore. I felt yeah. like I did six months on main stage for you. I did really well. You didn't reward me for it. You did give me ETC later, mm-hmm. but it was kind of like, it felt like a little too late. And I was being, I completely understand now that I was being spiteful to them in some ways because I was reviewed well in that show that I did do on the ETC it would have been natural for me to stay and write more I just didn't want to that's okay yeah and I think that you know uh, speaking of starting trends I think that's actually much more common now is for people to only do one show and then move on maybe two but like the I think you know it was more the, the standard was three shows Yes. And I, the the crazy thing is looking back, that is my favorite job I ever had in my life doing that, that's performing. And I realize that now in my forties, that the opportunity was amazing to have an audience every night. I didn't know at that point that I'd come to LA where if you get 15 people in your crowd, you're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was just these great audiences and performing. My castmates were always so great. I loved them. It had nothing to do with them. It was so great. I just was sort of mad at the institution, just being a spiteful kid. And I thought I better get to LA. I'm 30. That's old for LA. I better get there. Let's take a quick break. And now back to the podcast. You know, the good thing is I do feel like everything works out in some way or another. When I moved to LA, I was introduced very quickly. I was doing some shows around here to Allison Jones. She Mm -hmm. came to one of my shows. I don't remember if it was just happenstance. I think it was that she came to one of my shows. If so, in other words, if I hadn't moved then, I never would have met her. And she has been the person for me who's been like a fairy godmother out here. She's the one who has cast me in almost every show I've ever been in. They've been smaller parts, but it's her every time. And sometimes she just calls me and is like, you don't have to audition. I'm giving you this. That's and amazing. That. That's success. All because I moved here at that time. So I guess I missed mm-hmm. out on Second City, but it was really fortuitous to meet her. Yeah. Yeah. And you've done, I mean, you've been on amazing shows. Yeah. And the, the work you've gotten to do is fantastic. I lo- And it's all her, really. I've been on a few, a few other shows cast by other people, but mainly her. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. Um, I know you guys moved, you left LA for a little bit and went back to Michigan. Yeah. Was there any particular reason? Was it for work? It was three things when I think uh, we might've touched on this, uh, like offline a little bit. When we mm. had our second kid, we freaked out. <laughs> it, so I don't know how to explain it. I know a lot of people in LA, this sounds very offensive. I don't mean it to. We had one kid and we just sort of thought like, we've done this. It'll be fine. We have a second Mm -hmm. kid. It'll be just a little extra work, but we've already done this. Well, it just wasn't, it was like overwhelming. And it, I don't, I personally don't feel like it's just a doubling of the work. It feels like exponentially more to manage. (laughs) And I don't mean that to sound offensive. I feel very validated by that being the case. Yeah. (laughs) You don't feel offended? Not at all. We only have one. And we, we, you know, we, we made that decision um, yeah. because of what we discussed earlier. Uh, but um, I feel very validated to know because many people who have urged us, especially family to have a second one, not knowing our, you know, the reasons for our choices. Yeah. You know, one of their big arguments or, or is that, oh, it's actually so much easier with a second. And I'm like, I don't, I don't think I'm so. Sure. That doesn't, it? Well, I mean, like, I feel like now <clears throat> I'm five, Vinny, our youngest is five. And now I'm like, now it is okay yeah but the, there's I mean I could go on for frick an hour I think there's a huge gap in the United States and it's not in other cultures on care for age zero to three uh-huh mm-hmm. especially just, now yes yeah. yes it's it's really really overwhelming and that's what we were straight into and I think the world has improved so much since I even had Vinny but I want to give this example of when I had Vinny I um, got a call from Conan to like be, do a bit. Mm-hmm. And I think Vinny was 
six days old. I had a huge medical problem at the time from delivering. And I was like, I have to do it because if I say no, or if I tell them that I had a baby, I'm just going to be taken off the list. Yep. It will happen. It happens to me. It happens yep. all the time. Not on that show, but for something else. Yes. Yep. So you I get removed. You, you do get taken off. So I went and I did it and didn't tell anybody. And I like hid my breast pump and I was only there five hours, but I was mm-hmm. like, people are like, how you doing? I'm like, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> like I had a baby six days ago and I'm yeah. like hiding. Oh breast my God, pump. Megan. <laughs> but like, that's how it just felt, it felt crazy to me and like trying to deal with my older son and trying to keep this acting job going without people knowing. Cause I felt like if I tell people I'm going to lose my job and that sort of, I, you know, I, I had trouble the first time around with work because I had a baby yeah. and everything I faced it in. And, and I do feel, like I said, I feel like progress has been made. Uh, I don't know if it's me too related. I don't know what, but I feel like now there's much more caution with people on how they treat women who have kids. At least mm-hmm. they're more cautious, I think. I don't know if that's true. I think it depends. I think it, it I, yeah. I, I Sometimes I see it, sometimes I don't, you know? Like sometimes I'm like, well, this institution, it, like I went to grad school because I, I couldn't audition because I was on bed rest, like we talked about, because I was in a very serious situation <sighs> while I was pregnant. They took me off every list, like, Oh, and then my agent said, or my manager said, like, are you still going to act, honey? Like after, and I was like, of course I am. But of course there was no auditions. She, she just said. I think you got your first one this year, right? Yeah. And um, I was like. Our son is almost seven. Yeah. They, <gasps> and I was two, I was six weeks postpartum and they sent me my agents for commercial who I love. They're, they're fabulous. They don't send me out anymore either, but they sent me out six weeks postpartum and um, I thought it was great. And I was like, I'm still swollen, but I could fit into my clothes. So they wanted me with my baby. And I was like, oh. okay, so I just get to be with my baby. And it's like a commercial with my baby. Yeah. Okay. So I went and Jason came because I was like overwhelmed. Yep. Yep. And um, I got the call back. <gasps> and the first time I had to just wear a sports outfit. So I wore like, you know, I was a spin instructor. It was fine. Yeah. Um, I got that. So we go back and it's all these six foot tall women. <laughs> Oh God. With their rented babies. With rented babies, not their babies. Like, and the babies were separate with their moms and dads. So I thought I was going in with those moms and dads. I was like to be the before and I was to like look like these women when I lost the baby weight. Oh my God. It was so offensive. And they wanted me in a bikini. And I didn't take off my clothes. I was like, no. Uh I laughed and I cried and I just left. I was like, no, I'm not doing that. No. I'm so sorry. Imagine springing that. I'm so sorry. That is so so done. That's when I went to grad school. And I'll tell you about grad school. They were so accommodating. I was like, well, I have a two-year-old. And they're like, that's okay. We don't care. He was like 18 months when I started applying. And they and they called and they were just like, it's okay. Like we can support you with your child. Like we can make accommodations. And they did. (sighs) They did constantly. Like they were just so receptive to that. Yes. And I was like, wow, I have never received such reception before. Like they they were like, we want you. Why so did they cares? understand that something know. that some, like you say, some institutions are missing that like everyone on this earth was born. Mm-hmm. Every one of you Everyone. had to be you all parented. Have a mom. Yeah. You all had to be like, I don't know if mothered, maybe some people have two dads. I don't know, but it's yes, like, yes. You, really? had, you had people who had to tend to you or you wouldn't have lived. And right. exactly. that is what we're doing here. I can, I will be able to work again. I, I may need a few weeks of tenderness and care, but like, I was even thinking after I had my first son, Jim Belushi, who has this, I tour around doing comedy with him. And he has a reputation as being such a man. I think he even wrote a book. I forgot the name of it, but it's all about like, man, man. Yeah. But he uh, it was couldn't have been more accommodating to me. He w- said to me, as we toured, bring your baby. Every place we ever played, he'd be like, she needs a room to pump in, get her a room. Because these were comedy clubs, a lot of them, which are male dominated at the time. This is mm-hmm. nine years ago. But I was like, oh, it really could be easy. It really could be. You yeah. never made me feel bad about it. I was still able to do the shows. I 
performed that whole time. He just made it easy. Yeah. Because yeah. he guys he gets it because he's got kids. He's got a yes. lot. He's he's a family man, and he yes. you know. So you toured with him doing stand up, stand up and improv. That's amazing. Yeah. And he and he paid you as a mom, and you were able to bring yeah. Your kids. And he's still. We're doing some shows next week in Wisconsin and Chicago. We still do shows, not as much as we did awesome. before, but we used to do a ton of shows when when Anthony was a little guy. I think we were doing sixty shows a year, and he just made it wow. so easy. Did you have to have a second job while you were doing that? I mm-hmm. did teach at Second City that whole time, yeah. but really he paid and continues to pay super well. It was more just for me because I wanted to be teaching at that time and be involved with Second City, mm-hmm. but I really didn't have to, no. Yeah, that's yeah, awesome. He was great and continues to be great. We just don't tour as much, which is a bummer, but it was an awesome. Well, maybe now that COVID is. Yes, yes. Sort of. In that yeah. yeah middle spot yeah when you got to LA did you did you uh, look for any work or did you just go teach at Second City like what was yeah I what were you doing? the first couple of months I just got the lay of the land I think the first two months and then I started uh-huh. teaching at Second City and okay. that was my main gig I I taught th- it, they made it progressively harder for teachers to get multiple classes but at that particular time I think it was two thousand nine. I was teaching four or five classes a week for them and doing extra coaching on the side. So Mm -hmm. I was totally able to make a living off of that. As time went on, because I taught there a bunch of years, as time went on, they kept reducing how many classes you'd be allowed to have. You guys both taught there, right? No. No. I thought you did. I finished the program before you started teaching there. Um, And I think I went on tour... No, actually, I was back from my tour oh, when we started okay. teaching. Yeah. Yeah. I was graduated from the writing program oh, there before okay. you started teaching, like just okay. before you started teaching. I think 2007. Oh, yeah. But I I didn't teach there. I, I've oh, taught outside of. Maybe that's why I thought that. Okay. So you were uh, teaching, making ends meet, obviously booking acting jobs, yep. which are great when they come. And then at what point yes. did you uh, shift into... Well, that I'm going to differentiate between coaching because you were coaching improv groups, but then you yes. you made uh, a big shift into what you're kind of doing what you're doing now, which is coaching for public yeah. speaking. Yes, I got hired as a writer at Jimmy Kimmel, which was yeah. another oh, awesome yeah. dream job. It was awesome. That's not even a side job. I that's loved, that's right down the middle. That's the career. That was yeah. It was the greatest. I really really loved it. I was not there as long as I wanted to be. This ties back to having a kid. I just did not understand. I wish there was coaching for women who are about to have babies because I was like, I have got this. Don't you worry. I worked at Kimmel until the day before I delivered. I worked till August 17th. I delivered Saturday morning, August 18th. And okay. Anthony. Yeah. And it was then I moved into the world of being rocked where I was like, wait, what? Everything is not what I thought it was going to be. And if someone had been able to tell me, Hey, give it a few months, you will be back. You'll be able to write again, et cetera. But I got a lot of feedback after I came back, which I don't, I I don't think they were really Mm -hmm. flexible with how I came back, meaning that they were like, do you want to come back in two weeks? And I was like, yeah, I guess. And then when I got to two weeks, I was like, oh, wow, this, I don't think I'm ready to be back. And then, and they were like, how about four weeks? And I was like, no, I'm not ready to be back. (laughs) Again, in hindsight, if I knew more about parenting, I would would have been like, look, I'll be back in 12 weeks. That's pretty normal. It's standard, but I didn't know to do that. So then when I did come back early, I think I came back at eight weeks, which is too early for me. I know there's some awesome moms who do come back really soon. It was not enough time for me. And especially it's a really rigorous job. It's really Mm -hmm. demanding. And I was learning how to be a mom. So I didn't last that much longer at Kimmel after that. The fortunate thing was while I was there, I was introduced to Sheryl Sandberg by a writer friend who was 
just starting her lean in book tour, lean in like the, mm-hmm, right. the phrase, everything that I feel like changed women everywhere. And she was looking for coaching from, she has like awesome coaches who live in DC, who are political coaches. They worked in the white house. They tell you, they advise you on everything legal, how to be on camera without getting into right. legal trouble. She wanted someone from Hollywood who was more acting and also who could write and potentially punch up jokes and things like that. So they introduced me to her because they're like, she writes and acts, which the people at Kimmel, that was also unusual. Like most people were just Mm -hmm. writers and then they hired separate people to do bits. So we, we met and Cheryl and I really hit it off straight up right away. She kept bringing me in for more and more work. And eventually I was on a plane with her. It's her plane. We're on the private plane. Did you shoot your morphine first? From... Or... <laughs> <laughs> Which was my first experience on a private plane. Like it was so amazing. I was like, wait, people fly this way? Like you don't have to go through security. You just go to these private airports and you drive it's so right. easy. Up to you the just stairs walk to the plane. plane. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's like all you need is your tail <laughs> number. And you're just on your way. It was like, and there were snacks and they were so nice. And it's it was like just us. Over. And Cheryl yeah, was like, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. It was amazing. And she said to me on that plane, she's like, can I talk to you? I think you should do this as a job. I have so many people I would refer you to. And wow. I was like, sure, <laughs> I'll do this. <laughs> I was so casual about it. But then the more people she referred me to, the more I was like, oh, I really like doing this. This is great. And I owe the entire business to That's her. That's amazing. Entire. Wow. Yeah. Yes. And now that, would you say, is that yeah. like your bread and butter these days? Is it? Nice. Yeah. That's fantastic. And yeah. so how does... How do you feel about that? Because that's a different career. That's mm-hmm. not acting. That's not writing. Yeah. But it seems, you know, from what I observe from the outside, like that is, you're passionate about it. I like it. It is writing. So I, I yes, write a lot of people's is. speeches too. So that part is writing. And then the acting coaching feels very similar to coaching improv because I coach them on how to deliver the speech. Most of these people are brilliant, but they're not yeah. performers. So I feel like I'm directing mm-hmm. level one improv most of the time. So I enjoy all of that. I miss doing more comedy. I really do. I haven't had like an acting gig since before yeah. the yeah. pandemic. Yeah. Paid acting gig. So I totally, totally miss that because I prefer a balance of the two, like getting some work, acting, and then getting to do this because it is fun getting to write for yeah. people. I It feels, honestly, it doesn't feel much different from Kimmel. Like my, I have a current client I'm writing for who I have to figure out her whole voice. It feels mm-hmm. a lot like Kimmel, figure out what jokes she can do in her speeches. So that part is all... I. Like my nerd brain, I love that. Like figuring out what will work coming out of people's mouths. Yeah. It, so I like that. A little bit of like character study. Maybe you have to learn their business a little bit as well. Yes. Yeah. Huh? Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Smart. <laughs> but also the writer, like, you know, um, writers, we like to dig deep. It's research and development. Yeah. It's like, it's like learning new topics, learning new information. It's yep. surprisingly interesting all the time. Yes, I I agree. Like, I would never know half the stuff I know. I just worked on someone's speech about a roof, insuring roofs on residential housing, which I'm like, okay, whoever, I know a lot about it, guys, if you ever want to know. I'm sure it'll come up. (laughs) In my next book, I'm going to be writing about roofs. So I'm going to call you up. Centers on a roofer. (laughs) The Hollywood roof murders. And do you say... Not roofies. No. no, no, no. Just roof. Um, well, we've had two alarms go off. So I, yeah, I, I we, we got to, we got to usher you out, I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're quiet. I know. I'm They're going welcome. to meet. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'll tell them. This is so awesome. And you've really explored like so much. I know there's so many more jobs you've done and we could talk we for another. We didn't even talk about French translation. I was going to do a whole French bit with you. Oh. Oh, God, oh, darn it. Right. <laughs> oh, most. <laughs> you know, that's all the French. That you know. is it. And I had to write it down beforehand. 
C'est tout. Nous sommes finis. Sont finis. Euh, c'est bon. Um... <rire> That's the most useful, useful bon. phrase bon. to know. C'est bon. That's well, all I remember from French class. Megan, thank you so much for, <laughs> for jumping on here with us twice for those who don't, you know, because we edited two things together because we got interrupted last time. Thank you for making the time and joining us. This has been just so yeah, great talking to you. Thank you so much. You're amazing. The book was great. We're going to link thank everyone you. to the children's book that Megan wrote because it's amazing and link to so many other ways you can see Megan. Thank you so much for having me. It's I can't believe it's been an hour we've been talking. It goes so fast Aww, with you guys. You're amazing. Thank you. Thank you. She showed on Monday. We would like to thank our guest, Megan Grano, and all of our guests from this season. And most of all, thank you to our listeners. We appreciate your support. We love doing this show and look forward to bringing you more incredible stories next season. Make That Paper is us, Jamie Parker Stickle and Jason Bieber. Episodes mixed and edited by Jason Bieber. Our theme song is Monday Girl by Jordan Bieber. Make That Paper is hosted on Anchor FM. If you like the show, do what all podcasts ask you to do. Subscribe, rate, review, and share and talk about it on social media, at work, family gatherings, and at your favorite watering holes.